am so excited about this word, and I know that uh, talking about the book of Ephesians and, and how this writing was written for all the churches and, and how that it is written to tell us what Christ has done for us through the death, burial, and resurrection, and we're under the new covenant of grace, and that under this new covenant now that we are seated in heavenly places and all the promises are yes and amen and everything that the kingdom uh, uh, contains has already been lavished on me. You know, it's such important scripture, that one in Ephesians 1, 3, that says, you know, everything that heaven contains has already been lavished on me as, as, as a love gift from my wonderful heavenly father who has uh, loved me and sees me wrapped in Christ. That's out of the TPT Bible. But it is just, Paul is trying to say to us, you are rich. Ephesians is telling you, you are rich. You are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You have a new home. You have a new position. And so uh, take your position in him and know your authority and what he has given you. And so in e Ephesians chapter 3, I just want to go through that because I this is a this is a prayer that Paul prayed for the churches, but also this is a prayer that I have prayed for years, and and uh, just allowing ourselves to embrace this in our lives and come into the full revelation of what this prayer is saying to us. And Paul is saying this out of, you know, and uh, I think it's 316 it starts that out of his glorious riches that he would strengthen you with dudamus, dynamite power, maximum power by the spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in us, right? Hallelujah. In our inner being in our inner core that we would have this miracle power and strength in us by the Holy Ghost, that Christ would dwell in our heart through faith, that Christ would be Lord in our heart. Get that in your heart, realizing that we, you know, through faith, hallelujah, that we be rooted and grounded in love. And as I meditated on that, you know, thinking about that, so, so what he's saying here is that our roots, our roots would go down into the love, rooted and grounded in his unconditional love. What for? To grab all the nourishment that the roots grab out of the soil. So God's love is very complicated. It's unconditional. It has many aspects about it. You see the fruit of the Spirit. You see the fruit of the Spirit is, is, is a fruit of love. But what is it? It's love. It's joy. It's peace. It's patience. It's goodness. It's kindness. It's gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. So there's many things that represent the love. And so those are the nourishes, nourishment that the roots are pulling out of the soil. That's supernatural. It's unconditional. It's all powerful. And it produces what? The fruit of love in our lives. And that people now can taste and see that the Lord is good because of the fruit. Oh, I get so excited about this, these scriptures and the promise that God has. And it says, he goes on to pray that I praise that that you would have the power now together with all the saints. You know, it's the saints that you are knitted together in love. No one's an island to themselves. We, that, that the love is about the relationships, that we are family together. We're blood family, brothers and sisters in the Lord. We would have the, the power together, together. To know the height, the width, the length, the depth of that love of what? The love of Christ. His love. And this week we are, we're going to be meditating and experience the love of Christ. How he laid down his life. He said, new commandment I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. Right? And no greater love than a man laid down his life for his friends. So we're seeing this week that he, Christ Jesus, laid down his life 
for you. Totally took on the curse so you would be totally blessed. Took on on all of the negative things, all of your sin. He paid it in full. He, he, he did the punishment so you weren't to live under punishment. You were to live in now a life of and life more abundantly. Oh, my goodness. Yet this is the very love that he put in us. To love us and let that love flow from us. You know, oh, my goodness. And then he goes on to say <laughs> that you would be filled with all the fullness of God. Oh, my goodness, in this. This is a choice. You have a choice. Oh, my goodness. I always felt that need, you know, the need to have the, to be strengthened with my inner being with that deutimous power by the Holy Ghost. There was that, like, I just knew I needed to pray that and I needed that. But yet, just seeing that why we need it and what it does for us. Then he goes on to say, now... He that's able to do exceedingly abundantly now above what you think, hope, imagine according to that what? Power. Remember the power that started way back here by the Holy Ghost doing? The power that dwells in you, that's working in you. And you know, there's another translation. I love this. Never doubt the power to perform this that does uh, in, infinitely above your greatest request, your most unbelievable dreams, your wildest imagination, and it outdoes them all because of the divine power of him that's energizing you. That's out of another translation. But oh my goodness, have you ever stopped to think, what are the dreams going on? What are, what are the visions you're having? You know, what is your request? Hey, when you choose love, he's able to do far above it. And you know, the Holy Ghost just so touched me about this. Think about the book of Ruth. That's a book of love. And, and you see, because you know, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Old Testament is an outward picture of the inward working of the new covenant. So we can look at the book of Ruth and, and, you know, I stop and I think about this book of Ruth. Here, 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 uh, Ruth, a Moabite. Now you have to understand the Moabites, you know, they were, they, they were under a curse because they didn't let the Israelites go through their land as they were heading to the promised land. So they were under a curse. And it said that they weren't allowed to come into the house of the Lord for 10 generations and here Naomi and her family moved to the Moabite land, to, to that land. And, uh, and her sons marry Moabites. But, her, but Naomi, her husband and her sons all died there. And they were there for about 10 years. And then uh, Naomi was, was an older woman now. She was at a time where she couldn't take care of herself, really. And she's heading back to uh, Bethlehem because she heard that it was being blessed. And so she decided to go back to her, her place, her, her, her land. And she had nothing, totally nothing to give. And there, Ruth, you know, one of the daughter-in-laws didn't, didn't go along. But Ruth, this was Ruth's mother-in-law. You know, you know what I mean, mother-in-law? <laughs> you know, the world and... You know, if you think the people that I'm most disliked are usually a mother-in-law. Now, my daughters love me, but I refuse to be called mother-in-law. I am mother of grace. No, we're not doing law. I'm grace. Hallelujah. <laughs> so, our mother in love. Whatever. Either one. Okay? But, uh, and, and so it's interesting, you know, when I get my nails done, you know, they, my my daughters in grace will come also and, and they'll show up. And, and so I will tell the lady that's doing my nails, I'll say, oh, there's my daughter in grace. They go, what is that? <laughs> I said, well, they're my daughters of love. We just love each other, you know. 
And so, anyway, I always give them a card. I always witness to them about Jesus, you know. And I always make sure I give a good tip. Yeah, hallelujah. So we have, but you have compassion for people. You want to be sure that you're generous and you care about their needs. But, uh, okay, back on the story of Ruth. Okay, Ruth. And uh, you guys don't really care about the nail thing, so I know. <laughs> Sorry about that. Went a little sidetracked with my sisters here. But, uh, okay, Ruth. Let's get back to the story. But here Ruth is. She is leaving all of her people. She's leaving her family and her parents and, and all of the, the land that she's familiar with, that, that she's known all of her life, and going to a strange land with Naomi because she is laying down her life for her mother-in-law. And she goes there, and Ruth can't, uh, Naomi can't take care of herself. Ruth going there and goes out into the fields because it's, it's barley time, it's harvest time for barley, and she works as a peasant in the field. And she goes to the field that she feels led to go to, but it is God that is moving and leaving on, uh, leading her. Because when you choose love, God is very involved now in, in causing, you know, your dreams to happen. The blessings in your life, the desires of your life. When you choose love, God is in the midst of bringing forth those hidden things of your heart. So she goes to that field. She's a peasant. She is picking up grain that falls to the ground that, you know, God's rules were that when you thresh the, uh, the harvest, the barley, that you were to allow the grains that would fall need to be for the poor, for those so that they, they get provision. And Boaz shows up. Boaz! But when he sees Ruth... He's heard all about her, but he instantly falls in love with her because she's in the love. She's in the love walk. So now uh, Boaz, Boaz's history is, is that his mother was Rahab the prostitute, and she was a Canaanite. And when they came into the promised land, she walked in love, and she rescued the, uh, uh, the spies, the Israelites. And out of that love walk that she did, she got rescued. And she ended up marrying uh, uh, Salmon, someone, and, and he was a, called a prince. And so now she, and she has this, this ranch, and Boaz is a very wealthy man. And he goes up to Ruth, and passion has grabbed his heart. The love of God has overtaken him. And he says to Ruth, he says, hey, um, she says she's Ruth. He's asked, who is this one? He wants to know all about her. He says, hey, I've told my men to leave you alone and protect you. You don't go to any other field. You come here. You drink of my water. You sit at my table. And he, say, and he, makes, and he tells them, leave extra grain for her. He makes sure she's fully cared for. She chose love. And God is saying, choose love. Choose love. Because there's dreams in your heart. There are your wildest imagination. There are deep desires in your heart. And love has the power to produce that. Was she going to the field to find a man? No, she was going to the field to feed her mother-in-law. To be a peasant and work in the heat of the, the sun so that she can make provision and she can be taking care of her mother-in-law, Naomi, who was crappy. A very crappy person, too, the word says. She loved. This is a picture of love. Well, guess what? She ends up marrying Boaz. And so she gets fully taken care of. She enters into this wealthy farm with this loving man. who, And then they have Obed. And Obed has Jesse. And Jesse has King David. And Ruth, a Moabite that was under a curse now because of love. She chose love, no matter who you are, no matter where you are. 
It doesn't matter. The day you choose the love of God is the day everything begins to change. Hallelujah. And Ruth is in the bloodline of Jesus. Wow, huh? That's the love story that Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16 through 20. I encourage you, pray that prayer. Meditate on that prayer. That is a powerful prayer in your life. Hallelujah. Let's go on and, and talk about. So uh, there's several scriptures I want to talk about here. Lou, uh, Jude 121 out of one translation says, Fasten your heart to the love of God. Fasten. Fasten it. Just stop and think about that word, fasten. First uh, Peter 4, 8 says this, above all. So this is above all, so we need to listen. Above all, uh, consequently, echo, echo, echo God's intense love. Echo, you know what echo is? You say something and it comes back at you, right? Echo, let it, let it be echoed. God's intense love for one another. For love will be a canopy over a multitude of sin. See, love covers a multitude of sin. We, we, we become Christ conscious and not sin conscious. It covers. It gets us out of judgment, love. And so, so Paul is now going on in chapter 4 of Ephesians, and he's saying, this is what the love of Christ, that unconditional love, should look like. Christ, the anointed one. And so let's, let's uh, look at these scriptures. And so um, Ephesians 4.1 says, As a prisoner of the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. And so Paul is saying here, and we know he's in prison, but he's also declaring to you, I am a prison to the destiny that God has planned in my life. I am one with it. I am bonded to it. I am chained to it. And I urge you now to live a life that is worthy of God's calling in your life. And so I urge you, that word urge, it's like, this is, a, this is desperate now. Grab, I, I've explained to you the love of that Christ gives us and what it offers you. Now I urge you to get in there. And live that life. Be a doer of that, that life of love. That, uh, that as, when they see you, they should see Jesus in your life now. It should ooze from you. It should produce that environment of, of his love around you. Oh, my goodness, that anointing. That's what he's saying there. Live that life of love. Be that doer of it, not only a hearer. Hallelujah. Live a life worthy of his calling. Well, that word worthy there means this to us. It means that all that God has poured into you, now fasten yourself to that and let that be what comes out of your life. Well, what is the worthiness that he gave you? It's living that and not how you feel. He's saying here, you have, you've had handicaps, you've had weakness, you have things in your life, but leave them behind. Let go of them. You're a new creation in Christ. Those things are not things you take into your born-again experience, your new life. You're a brand-new person in me. Let that go now and embrace what I've given you. Worthy. What has he given you? He's given you his very love. Love was shed abroad in your heart by the Holy Spirit. He's given you uh, his, his very grace and what he's done. He's given you uh, his own righteousness. He's given you his very names. He's given you the power to prophesy and produce your tomorrow by your words. He's given you his faith. He's given you. Everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's given you his divine nature to flow out of you. He's also set you up to be successful. He's given you life and life more abundantly. He's given you all the blessings are yours and amen. Hallelujah. He's, he's, 
just on and on. He's given you health. He's given you wealth. He's given you relationships in the body of Christ. Brothers and sisters, he's given you a family. The family of God. Oh, my goodness. It's more than you can bear. It's so exciting to know this and to embrace this, making your call worthy because you've embraced what he says you are and not how you feel you are. Let that go. The, you know, the word, it's so important. He's saying, now, this is the way, walk ye in it. This is the love of Christ. Hallelujah. So it goes on to say this. It's really interesting. 1 John 4, 17 says, as he is, so are we in this world. So now we need to say, how was he? So am I. Hallelujah. Uh, 1 Thessalonians uh, 2, 12. To live a life worthy of the Lord who calls us into his kingdom and the glorious blessings of his. So again, he's saying worthy, stepping into that place. The Bible says this, and, and uh, Proverbs 23, 7 says, for as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So get those God thoughts going in your heart. Come into that agreement in your heart of such say it, God, let the visions of God now, now take over in you. Let, let that realm of what Christ gave you through his death beyond resurrection, let it rule and reign in your heart. Fasten yourself to that. Praise God. This, turn to your neighbor and say, this is good. I needed this tonight. This is the Holy Ghost. You that are watching, turn to your spouse and tell them or your kids or just shout in your, while you're watching this program how, how this is just touching your heart. Praise God. Hallelujah. So he goes on to say this, verse 2, with tender humility, quiet patience, always demonstrate gentleness. Now, now this is a picture of the love of Christ. So he's telling you th this is the way you operate in it. And, okay, always demonstrate gentleness and generous love towards one another, especially towards those who try your patience. He's saying, hey, now this is it. Now, tender humility means this, unselfish concern for the welfare of others, a total absence of arrogance, conceit, and haughtiness. You know, James talks about having that humility of heart. The humility of heart is this. I know it's Christ in me and not me. I know it's him, that what he gave me, and I'm embracing that, and that's what flows out of my life. That is the humility that God is, that tender humility that we're to walk in. You know, the book that I just got done with, I know God wrote that. I just, you know, he said, write this book. I said, I give it to you, you write it. And it just started flowing. So it's just the flow of the Holy Ghost. And so I just have to give him the credit and the glory. I can't take it. I'm sorry. That's the truth. I just have to be honest with you. It's him. Hallelujah. And, and I, I just feel that it's one of those life-changing books. God fuels Great, wait, God's grace fuels my passion. Anyway, so just letting you know that. But knowing that, knowing that, you know, humility is that you're happy with and content with your purpose, your destiny, what you were born to do, what God put in you to do, the race he called you to run, and you embrace that, and you are excited about all of the team players and the people in the kingdom and what God has called them to do. And uh, uh, you're not, you know, in James where it talks about the humility is that uh, uh, pride is full of Bitter envy, wanting what somebody else has. That's what pride is. Selfish ambition and, uh, and, uh, and self-promotion. And that is a devilish wisdom. That's not God. Humility, God gives grace to the humble. Hallelujah, because we know that I have an anointing in what God's called me to do. But I don't have an anointing in what God's called you to do. 
But together, we're all about building his kingdom. And, uh, and so, you know, I was telling uh, the girls that when we go to conferences or that, our prayer in the morning is, oh, Lord, you know, we're not going there to promote ourselves. We're praying about God. Let us touch somebody's love. Let us be a blessing. Let us give something to other people around us. And the people we touch today, let them feel loved of Christ. And so we go. And, and uh, you know, they usually have people that pick us up and take us to the meetings and that. And uh, we, we always get them a gift. We always pray with them. We always remember their names when we come back. And you know, we're not the speakers at these conferences. So... But we, we come to bless those that are serving in the house and bless those around us. That's what humility, tender humility is. It thinks of others and it's not about you. And we see in the, in, uh, in, in, uh, when David was king, you know, Absalom. Think about Absalom, the oldest son, because he killed the oldest son. So now he's the oldest, you know, because... Uh, the oldest son raped his sister, so he killed the oldest son. And now, now Absalom thinks, you know what? I should be king. Now, God appointed David to be king. And the Bible talks about in Acts chapter 2 that David saw the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. He believed it. He prophesied about it. And so he stepped into that life of grace. He stepped into the anointing and the appointment of grace for him to be king. And, he, and so he wasn't perfect in any way. Nobody is perfect <laughs> in the kingdom. And so sometimes we think we could do better than somebody else. I should have that job. I should have that position. I could do that better. Well, maybe you could, but God has chosen who he wants. He has anointed who he wants, and that's the person that Christ will move through and do better than you. Because it's not them that does it. It's the Christ in them that is to do it. And so Absalom thought, I can do better than King David. And so he stood at the gate, and, and every time people went to see the king, and they'd come out and not be all, always very happy. Small oh, Absalom was right there, and he'd say, well, I would do better, and I'd give you this. And so he began to, to move in that, that realm of, of manipulation and that realm of disloyalty towards his father. And the Bible says that he actually stole the heart of the people of Israel from David. But God never anointed Absalom to be king. God anointed Pastor, uh, who is it? Uh, king David, I mean. And God is wanting us the tender humility is being able to be happy with your purpose, your plan, and the anointing on you. The Bible talks about there are gifts of grace, and that's the best place for us to be is in that place that I'm in, the gift of grace that God placed in me, and being able to cheer each other in their place of grace and being content and happy with that, not being full of envy for somebody else. And so when he's talking about tender humility here, he's talking about this, not thinking you should have somebody else's position, what they have, not lifting yourself above God's purpose for your life. Humility is being happy in your lane in your race, and knowing that it's Christ in you. Uh, praise God. Hallelujah. So I got so much more to do on humility, but we're going to learn how the love of Christ should look. Paul talks about it, tells us how to pray, how what to receive, and then he tells us what it looks like. So we will continue on with that. Hallelujah. Part two. So tonight... I just want to really encourage you as you're listening to the word tonight that really commit yourself to that prayer of love and uh, then allow that tender humility of Christ now 
uh, uh, be in your life, that you walk in that humbleness that knows that it's Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's Christ that has anointed you for the position you're called to do. And whatever you're called to do is the best place to be in Christ. Hallelujah. So I really encourage you in that tonight. Let's, let's just end with prayer here and uh, just repeat after me. Dear Father God, I ask you to forgive me of my sins. And I ask your son Jesus... Come into my heart, be my Lord and my Savior. Fill me with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name, amen.